Don't forget our 2023 calendar featuring some of our favorite main characters of paleontology from Classic Eons episodes is available now at ComplexityCalendars.com. And exciting announcement, we also just released a puzzle. For our first ever puzzle, we're celebrating the process of carcinization with a reconstruction of what's thought to be the oldest false crab, Platycoda. It's available now at DFTBA.com. Nestled in the hills of Slovenia, just west of a small village, a stream has cut a ravine down through the earth, revealing layers of rock and a rich array of fossils. Tiny algae, mollusks, fish, and insects are preserved there, along with plants like seagrasses and leaves from trees like pines and willows. These fossils date from the Miocene Epoch, around 11.6 to 12.7 million years ago, and paint a picture of a shallow seaside bay near a forest. And in the mid-2000s, researchers realized that this bay was once full of seahorses. Paleontologists have unearthed more than two dozen seahorse fossils at this site, the oldest ones known so far. But what were seahorses doing there exactly? Most of Slovenia today isn't exactly oceanfront property, and recent genetic analysis suggests that seahorses didn't originate there. Today they're found in all of the world's oceans. But open ocean swimming is a real challenge for an animal better suited to clinging to a stalk of coral or a blade of seagrass than swimming long distances. So how did one of the ocean's worst swimmers spread around the globe? And where did they come from in the first place? It turns out it all comes down to plate tectonics. Seahorses are pretty unique looking fish, I'll give you that, with their upright posture, long prehensile tails, and horsey looking heads. Yet despite their weirdness, they are still fish. They belong to a group called Cygnathids, which includes seahorses, sea dragons, and pipefishes. And while fossil seahorses are rare, fossils of other cygnathids are more common, especially around the Mediterranean Sea. The oldest fossil from this group discovered so far is called Prosolanostomus. It dates back 48 to 50 million years ago from the Eocene epoch of what's now northeastern Italy. But if we compare the genomes of living species and use the differences between them as a kind of evolutionary stopwatch, then we know that cygnathids likely split from other related groups much earlier, probably around 87 million years ago. And this older genetic signal makes sense when we compare it to the fossils. By the time Prosolanostomus appeared, we already see some of the iconic adaptations of modern seahorses and pipefish. These are things like fused jaws, no pelvic fins, and a body covered in bony plates rather than scales. They had even probably already evolved the male brooding behavior that seahorses are so famous for, too. Male seahorses have a brood pouch, but all modern cygnathid dads actually carry their babies to some extent, too, even if it's just sticking eggs to their belly skin like the snake pipefish does. Turns out the ocean is full of cool fish dads. And the fact that so many species do this means that male brooding is likely an ancestral condition, rather than something that independently cropped up multiple times. So by the time of Prosolanostomus, there were already species that shared a lot of the adaptations of seahorses. But none had that classic seahorse shape yet. It would take something else for that to happen. By the Oligocene Epoch, beginning 34 million years ago, the ancestors of seahorses were able to spread from their home base in the Mediterranean region to other areas, including Southeast Asia. And here's where plate tectonics enters the evolutionary story of seahorses. Throughout at least the last 55 million years, the ocean floor around Southeast Asia, especially around Indonesia, has been an absolute mess of plate tectonics. And maybe the most important shift happened around 25 million years ago, near the end of the Oligocene. As the Australian plate under what's now New Guinea pushed northwards, it slammed into a mishmash of plates under what's roughly the modern Philippines, as well as the stable southeast tip of the massive Eurasian plate. And this enormous geologic impact transformed what had been a deep channel between the continents into many large shallow seas. And this may have been a big deal for the ecosystem there, as being closer to the surface would bring a host of changes to the seabed, like exposing it to more sunlight. Different types of life could thrive in these new conditions, including corals, and especially important for seahorses, sea grasses. With more sunlight, it was easier for seagrass to photosynthesize. And as plate tectonics gradually brought up the seafloor, local seagrass beds could expand their range. And it's these seagrass meadows that we may have to thank for modern seahorses. Some scientists have hypothesized that the conditions in these seagrass beds could have pushed the cygnathids to transition from a long and straight posture to the upright posture we see in seahorses today. For one thing, the beds may have supported the kind of ambush hunting that seahorses use to grab food. It might be kind of funny to think of seahorses as predators, but they typically hunt by lying in wait among corals, seaweeds, or seagrasses, and snapping out at small prey passing by. 
Being upright actually gives seahorses a longer reach when striking, and this posture may have helped them blend in and camouflage among the plants, too. Also, losing their long, fishy tail in favor of a prehensile one could have allowed them to not just float near seagrass, but actually grab onto it. And this might have helped them save energy instead of having to constantly tread water to stay in place. While we don't have fossils that show this transition, seahorse DNA supports the seagrass hypothesis. For example, the ancestors of seahorses seem to have split off from their closest relatives around the same time as these seagrass beds appeared, roughly 25 million years ago. And when we compare the genetics of species from around the world, we see that the oldest and most diverse lineages come from the area around what's now Indonesia. This suggests that this is where they originated. So it seems that early cygnathids, which look more like pipefish, may have evolved into seahorses thanks to an ecosystem created by plate tectonics. But while it might be easy to think of the ocean as a single biome, it's actually made up of many different ones, like coastal shallows, reefs, and the open ocean. And like biomes on land, geologic activity can alter these areas in big ways. In this case, through things like changing light levels, altering currents, and generating new habitats. And a new habitat can be enough to push an existing lineage to take on new, sometimes strange, forms. But while these Oligocene seagrass beds might explain how seahorses evolved in the first place, the question remains, how did they get from Southeast Asia to the rest of the world? Well, it looks like plate tectonics is behind this too. While seahorses are not great swimmers, they are champion rafters. They can hold on to clumps of seagrass or seaweed traveling along an ocean currents with their tails. And we can chart their expansion by analyzing the genomes of living species. Their genetics suggest they first moved westward from Southeast Asia along with the current. Today, this strategy would take them as far as the east coast of Africa before they'd need to turn south and go around the Cape of Good Hope, which is possible, and some later lineages might have done that, but it's difficult. It turns out, though, that early seahorses didn't need to. At this time, Africa hadn't yet collided with Eurasia, which left an opening that they could travel through. This now-closed seaway is known as the Tethys, a kind of proto-Mediterranean, and it allowed seahorses to return back to the Cygnathid homeland, as well as travel straight into the Atlantic Ocean. They could then raft across the Atlantic and through the gap between North and South America to enter the Eastern Pacific in a series of seahorse shortcuts. From their origins in the seagrass beds of Southeast Asia to their journey around the globe, the evolution of seahorses has been shaped by the movements of our planet's tectonic plates. And while we often think about their effect on the lives of terrestrial animals, they play just as big a role in creating the patterns of diversity that we see in our oceans. So, if it weren't for plate tectonics, seahorses would never have been able to take over the world. Why the long face? <laughs> we are here to thank this month's eontologists. Jack C. Weiss, Colton, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Chase Archambault, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davison Ng, and Jake Hart. Become an eonite at patreon.com slash eons, and you'll get fun perks, like submitting a joke for me to read. Here's one from Hosni. Why does a moon rock taste better than an earth rock? Because it's a little meatier. <laughs> We're overdue for a good joke, I feel like. That's a good one. <laughs> and as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more ancient adventures. Turns out the ocean is full of cool fish dads. <laughs> I'm just so happy I get to say that. <laughs>